Hi, welcome to Aspects of D&D number two, I guess this is. Um, you don't have to watch the first one, which is about how D&D is created as a game by its rules, uh, but you might enjoy watching it. Uh, this episode is going to be, or this edition is going to be, about call it the central play loop of D&D. What actually is the thing that hap that is D&D that happens in Dungeons and Dragons, uh, particularly in earlier editions where I think the rules have a, a clearer focus in most respects. Honorary mention actually to fourth edition, very clear focus there if uh, you've played it. But what is the central play loop? And and not just that, what it, I, I'd call it a feedback loop. It's something that keeps cycling in and out. Uh, it is, a, or again, it's an, uh, if you know the term, an OODA loop. Um, it's Colonel Boyd's OODA loop. Basically, there is a particular thing that happens, I think, in D&D. Uh, that might sound basic, but it's important to know. It's that you gain information about the situation, uh, you spend resources or, or utilize mechanics or invent solutions present in the game, um, you succeed or fail, and you iterate. Uh, I call it an OODA loop because that's observe, uh, orient, decide, act. Is it that way around or is it orient, observe? I'm pretty sure it's observe, orient, but observe, orient, decide, act. This idea that you gain information and uh, you decide and you act. And the point, the way it's a feedback loop is that um, it's that you're iterating on it. You keep getting new information, you process it, you um, make better decisions next time. And this sounds very basic. It's basic to lots of games. Anything you're trying to get better at, you know, if you're playing Elden Ring, you're doing this at some level. Of course, Elden Ring is is based eventually on things like D&D. Um, many role-playing games are like this, but not all. It's something I was thinking, are all role-playing games just really this? And I was thinking, well, one, no, story games generally aren't, you know. Something like Mouse Guard, which is a game I like, uh, is not like that. You, you don't, you're not, uh, you may well choose to go for suboptimal uh, s solutions to problems because they're more dramatic or interesting. Uh, you're not you're not attempting to get better at the game. And even a more simulationist mechanical structure like Tales from the Loop is the same. You're not trying to uh, gain information about the world, iterate and, and get better. Uh, there's something else going on in that game. But in D&D this is central. It is the central play loop is to gain information uh, to work out what to do about it, to then use resources, spells, um, mechanics, solutions you invent that are non-mechanical. Do it, find out if you succeed or fail, Fi do it again, find out more in the next situation. If you watch uh, my Dark Sun stream, uh, you can see the group attempting to deal with ha things just going horrendously wrong in a very difficult setting and talking about what they need to do better next time. Uh, yes, so this is also something, the reason it's so important I think in D&D is at a meta level it's because D&D I think is a game where the central thing that's happening is you're attempting to get better as adventurers, you're attempting to level up. Essentially it's baked in to the rules uh, from the off I think that um, you are trying to get better at stuff and you are processing information, you're processing locations, quests, gold, whatever it is. All these things are being put into the mixer to make you uh, better. And I think it's also something that's emphasised by the earliest designers pretty pretty commonly, pretty regularly. And I'll just give the example I was thinking of is from the first edition PHB, Gary's Advice to Players. I, I might, I, I'll actually quote one other thing to Dungeon Masters too. Uh, but, well, uh, you also see it actually in say I think about some stuff I read both by Jim Ward and by Rob Koontz, two members of Gary Gygax's earliest playgroup, and them in uh, four words to adventures or in advent or in interviews from the noughties, stuff they were doing at that point, and they were reflecting. And there's a perhaps there may be one supposes a um, a a gold tinted rose tinted thing going on here, but they kind of talk about the idea that often you characters meant to run away you're meant to make decisions about the information in front of you and people learn their lessons the hard way now a reason to think this might be uh, not just rose tinted is that Gary does describe something like that in his adventure his successful adventures advice in uh, the PHP he says few players are skim skillful at fancy role-playing games as to not benefit from advice skill center and skill is iterative 
many readers will be new to the form if not totally uninitiated. And he talks basically classically, it's mostly about dungeons and underground stuff, but it also applies to wilderness and city adventures. And the idea is you, uh, it, it, well, some of it is meta. You prepare yourself before the session, you know what you're doing. You establish an objective. Then in the session, you, you are cooperating. Uh, particularly important when you're low level, you try to be a good table. Survival at lower levels is usually dependent upon a group action and team spirit. So there is um, an objective, survival in this case actually of all things, there's a thing where you might fail, there is a fail state, and one thing you need to succeed is to uh, to work together. So it's a skill, everyone has equipment, so everyone is bringing tools, the tools are things that resolve problems, he says each character has a selection of equipment, don't duplicate, don't miss stuff out. And uh, you should make proper preparations, safety of henchmen and or goods which are to remain behind, for instance. So there are, deci again, decisions. Work out formations, he says, uh, when everything is uh, set to go. A few more touches will be of great help. Assign formations. Uh, yeah. Who's the leader? Who's the second rank? And is the second rank tall compared to the characters before? In a game I was running just tonight, a player said, or made the point that their dwarven character was three foot eight. So if there was a pole arm in the second rank, it should be fairly easy to get over them. Uh, mapping is in order. It's very important because it helps assure the party will be able to return to the surface and avoid unnecessary encounter. This encounters. This advice, he says, usually means the difference between success and failure when it is followed intelligently. When your party has an objective, wandering monsters are something which stand between them and it. Uh, so this general idea that it also says that if you're lost, the objective becomes to find your way out because that only then can you safely return to the, the mission. Uh, and so on and so forth. And he says, superior play makes the game more enjoyable for our participants. So there's something where you plan, you learn your skills, and there's an implication, therefore, that you take advice to get better. Um, and uh, though he doesn't talk about the information there, um, you get, uh, obviously, you get examples in the very pl early play, exam play examples of players asking for information. Um, for instance, in the first edition, DMG, uh, if memory my memory is uh, serving me correctly give me one moment and uh, we'll go and uh, where is this so, yeah the first, a sample dungeon 94 this kind of thing that i should be a pro about and just know the page numbers tony huso is very good at knowing his page numbers so um he gives a play example and uh, the DM says, what are you going to do now? And the lead character the lead character says, light our torches, go down the steps. They then discuss, here's the information on the sheet of notepaper. We'll change it only if one of us is wounded, lost, or killed. So that's the formations. Why are the gnome and the halfling in the front rank? That way all, fi all five of us can fight. And the torches spoil the infravision capabilities, yes, but the humans won't be able to see. So constant flow of information. You went, uh, the lead character says later, enter the area and look around. The DM says you're in a chamber about 30 feet across to the south and 30 feet wide east and west. And this goes on for several pages of making decisions and changing the plans. Okay, we'll form a human pyramid and see if there's a secret door. The halfling has a 1 in 6 roll of uh, chance of slipping and bringing you all down. Roll of 4 follows. So it doesn't happen. Uh, but even the feeble work at the top seems to indicate some sort of space beyond. So, lead character, let's change the plan a bit. The cleric and I will hoist the gnome up and hold his legs firmly. There's an iteration based on information, based on success and failure, um, and uh, bearing in mind limitations and changing things as, as the game goes. Uh, this is central, and it's central across all uh, the, main, the types of adventure, the main types of adventure we see described by Gary in the early books and in experience you know he would describe the dungeon the city and the uh, the dungeon the wilderness and the city adventure i think they are identifiably you could describe them as the three main genre meta genre perhaps is a better way of putting it and what i'm going to do for the remainder of uh, this video is i will uh, go through examples i think a couple for each just to talk about how this play loop of gaining information um, and uh, deciding on it, acting on it, learning from it, success, failure, iterating happens in different kinds of adventure situations to show, um, I guess, show it in action, kind of do, do a bit of an analysis of it in action and show it applies um, and that it is something which can happen in all those kinds of adventures and situations. So we've got here in front of us 
the map of the uh, the caves of chaos in B2 uh, keep on the borderlands. Uh, there's also the way that Gary talks about the DM's role here. I think pretty clearly shows his his big emphasis on neutrality in this. Um, I think clearly shows uh, that he's the the idea that because this is a game and because you're there to reward success and punish failure, um, and you're there to give information neutrally. He describes. Uh, and he does the same in, in the DMG, that therefore this loop, the OODA loop, um, this, this central feedback loop is, is what the play is about. And that, by the way, that is uh, connects to this original meaning of role playing, not where you play a role like an actor, but you play a role uh, in the sense of you function as a game piece. You play a role like in a sport. Uh, you are a thief. You are not. You, you might enjoy having a character with a background and a story and particular mannerisms, uh, but the thing you are is a thief, and the thief has certain skills and certain abilities that no one else has. Uh, and so, yeah, when, when you see it like that, and you think, ah, oh, okay, so each character and each player has particular contributions uh, to the the team ethic and to the success of the enterprise, uh, which depends on this loop and not on this other thing where. Uh, oh well, you know things that might people might find fun, but are not the same game as D and D. If it's a different thing, then it's not like the earliest uh, editions of D and D, and it's not like what modern D and D presents itself as. So B two, keep on the borderlands. We've got the map of the caves of chaos here, and a key thing you might notice is this is what I, the one I want to draw attention to. I think is there are A B C H G I uh, D E F etc. A uh, K there are all these cave entrances going up the, can you see the contour here, up the slope. Um, there is even a J on the uh, top. And these are roughly difficulty coded. Not completely, uh, but basically. So the idea is you go out and there's a, there is a wilderness section. There's a, there's a keep, there's a, a settlement, uh, which some people really love compared to Homlet. Some people prefer Homlet 2 of Gary's two big settlements uh, there's also um, well there's a I've got the wilderness map up there uh, which has I think has B1 cave of the unknown on as well and it has these couple of other locations that he adds in um, the mound of the lizard men the spider's lair the bandit camp and the mad hermit uh, so you can go and do other stuff and there is uh, you know you there's a degree of you going around the wilderness and stuff wandering uh, Let's just uh, check here. Yeah, adventures outside the keep. Camping outdoors overnight. And uh, monsters may seek you out in a particular area. Things like that. So it connects to these other kinds of gameplay. But it's mostly a dungeon. And uh, the he, he does give uh, some comments on monsters learning from experience. If monsters can learn from experience, so should players. Tribal alliances and warfare. Ransoming prisoners, etc. And so, yeah, you get particularly, let's say, you look around and there's, on the ground, there's A, G, E, and D. A enters the kobolds uh, layer. E is the ogre, the ogre's layer. Uh, G is the shunned cavern. And uh, uh, D is the other one, isn't it? D is... Uh, it's not the orc layer. What is D? D, D, D. Uh, is D an open entrance? D may be a... Um, a oh, D is the goblin layer. So you have some, the outermost ones, A and D, go into the weakest monsters. Uh, further in, if you go all the way to the back of the ground, the ground layer, the ground contour, uh, you have the shunned cavern, uh, which has a empty gallery which can have random encounters uh, if you're noisy for from an owlbear or a grey ooze. There's a shallow pool with gr three grey oozes, um, which is not a, a, an amazing experience, if we're honest. Uh, <laughs> um, they uh, they're three HD. You might be if you're first level going into that uh, back on G. Uh, you may have a very bad experience. So, even on the ground layer, there are these different options. E is ogres. Ogres are obviously tougher than 
uh, goblins and kobolds on the whole. On the whole, uh, but you can bribe the ogres, and maybe if you negotiate, well, if you try to fight the ogres first level, guys, you're gonna you're gonna struggle. He has three D twelve, or th sorry, one D ten plus two damage attack, HD four plus one, uh, HP twenty five, AC four. He's only got one attack, so you could mob him. Uh, but uh, that's going to be tougher, particularly at first level, just because he's going to take several attacks. His AC is decent. Uh, you're going to have to do five or six, seven successful hits, um, whereas he can... Uh, Magic Missile 1d6 plus one, I guess, uh, whereas he is going to be fairly regularly uh, hitting in, you know, every other turn or something, probably hitting and killing you. So, you'd be better to bribe him. Maybe there's a learning curve thing there. Because it's though he's a tougher opponent, he uh, can be worked with. Here, the shunned cavern, I guess um, you're going in and you're going further to the back. And it's still not immediately necessarily dangerous, but you do have stuff uh, coming off it that is more dangerous. So I think what you may experience is, I, I at either side, 33 is the grazers, 34 here is the owlbears. And there's no access to the rest of the complex, so it's actually a very low value in terms of uh, exploration value area to go. Probably, uh, despite the fact that it's not um, automatically immediately dangerous, and you can get treasure there, it's you get you need to learn that um, once you've identified at the very most identified there's dangerous stuff there, you don't go back there until you're much higher level. But on the other hand, D and A on the lowest level things that are in other respects uh, less dangerous um, in some respects it's it's a tough one uh, but less dangerous monsters I mean you can go in and uh, and they are going to be weaker so uh, that for instance kobolds are half an HD and uh, the goblins are they yeah they might they're one HD minus one they're much weaker they've got eight, HP three or two that sort of thing um, and so in a straight fight between a reasonable party of basic characters six to eight characters or whatever they're going to often hold their own that your pcs are stronger than them and uh that they're, they're going to immediately be able to start getting combat xp and taking their treasure now the kobolds do have a trap here they've got a pit trap because they're clever so they've got a pit trap and there's a three and six chance that each person in the front rank will fall in uh, interesting by the way unless they're probing ahead so there is a condition. You can ten foot pole it, and Gary in the in the PHB explicitly says not to duplicate too many ten foot poles because, of course, people will want them. Uh, yeah, so it's it's one d six damage, ten foot deep, and the pit lid closes, and you need to be able to open it. And the noise will attract giant rats and kobolds. So, of course, the fact that he that there's a few things here. One. Um, there's there's a trap you you will learn in the future and it's a good early experience for a character to fall in uh, and die I mean I, I know in a basic game uh, that I've run over the years at uh, the one one player's first character did die falling in a pit in um, the Mokhtar layer in uh, an almost sub subsurface environment and so yeah you learn a lesson you know that flaws have to be paid attention to to get good at stuff for your players to survive more uh, of course ASC screws around with the pit trap 10 feet back so you, you can you can teach players that they can't always expect the same thing but players who don't know anything complete neophytes will not always think to check and that will lead to a learning experience that goes back to the start of the loop um, and you know there are consequences monsters come and get you and you can also though this is the the final thing to say here you're told and Gary makes the point here that apart from the monsters learning you can also um, there's skirmishing going between the goblins and hobgoblins versus the orcs, sometimes with null allies, and the kobolds hope to be forgotten by all, all and the bugbears pick off any stragglers. You might give them information that means they start negotiating, in which case uh, you don't necessarily need to say, well, the only loop here is about how well they can storm the base. In the Giants trilogy, which are the kind of, I think, the archetypal base assaults, the assumption is you're going into kill a bunch of stuff and to find out what's going on and to stop the giants doing things that the good guys don't want them to do whereas here well and this comes up in Stonehell uh, is an obvious example so is Sunless Citadel they all play the same trope 
kobolds who kind of want to either be safe in the middle or are in trouble or oppressed can be allied with or could be allied with and you can see um, the kobold complex isn't super connected but certainly the fact that you could get some treasure there and you can make it your own base or you can gain allies who can protect you there uh, whereas uh, over here uh, d &E, the ogre and the goblin uh, connect around up to F as well so there is you know you've got your loops going on there further up you're going to find more dangers and players might might say let's go straight to the top they will quickly find out that some things are tougher than others by doing that and and that's good and appropriate um, and here Gary so n J is the null layer for instance and K is the shrine of evil chaos and it's good that players learn that and here Gary gives you a very very a visual guide the inverse of a dungeon going down in terms of level one of the dungeon equals level one characters here he does a, a, a similar thing but tiered upward so it's it's um, kind of yeah it's visually keyed there is a different kind of dungeon that's the classic dungeon loop I think with the uh, kind of roots in and out uh, the terrain and um, factions and things like that kind uh, negotiation defeating particular monsters and there are things like certainly uh, grey users are a good example there of a specialized monster with different rules even in basic uh, but that's one version of it but another version of the dungeon adventure which i think gives a, a different informative example of of the play loop is joe fall hu4 joe fall by anthony who so great module great low level module at second or third level um, it's a planar, low-level planar module, uh, so it uh, should in some ways make you think of some of those great Planescape modules or, or adventure uh, seeds. This is this is as good or better than any of those. Uh, the idea is that only very low-level creatures can be sent to the tomb of Shodred Dakod, the Gringling Lich, in the astral plane, because no one else can remember where it is or what, what's happened. It's shielded against those two who are too powerful. And so low-level mooks get, can get sent because they can slip under the radar. Uh, it is an hourglass shape, and uh, I'll do a review one day. And basically the players need to loop through it, more or less. They have to iterate their way through, usually multiple times through the, uh, or I think pretty much definitionally multiple times, through the hourglass to get to uh, the real uh, treasure room, uh, which is, is, is VC7, is it? Is VC7 the, yeah. They cannot flee to the astral plane via their silver cord. You can see there's uh, a very atmospheric uh, hour hand or whatever. Um, and uh, they can start stealing all this incredible treasure. Uh, but a lich is waking up and guardians are attacking, like shadow guardians are attacking them. So that's the gimmick. Uh, you can see that there are these different rooms which are correspond to different parts of the hourglass in terms of uh, the designs and shapes. And they each have different challenges. This is a puzzle dungeon, and the puzzle dungeon is, I think, a, not an uncommon, it's not super common, particularly a good puzzle dungeon, but it's not an uncommon dungeon type, and um, it is maybe even more pointed, even more pure in this iteration OODA loop um, sort of thing than the the more classic dungeon. It doesn't mean it's better, uh, in fact, there's a reason why these tend to be both easier to design for many good designers, and uh, more famous and better examples because of the openness. The fact you're like, okay, I went and did this with this group and then this happened. It's much more flexible. The puzzle dungeon tends to have certain kinds of solutions. Other very famous puzzle dungeons, S1 Tomb of Horrors is maybe the most famous. Um, but another good example is S6 Labyrinth of Madness, uh, Prince of Nothing recently reviewed um, by Monty Cook. The, these kind of high, high concept um, and very precise and very much based on you understanding a challenge or and or failing to understand a challenge and having to iterate. So here, there's a bunch of things here that are learning things. You enter the astral, from the astral you come through the membrane and you enter inside this thing of sand and there's these blocks that try to attack you um, and push you into plasma. It's a bit messed up. and But really you're meant to just leave, uh, essentially. Um, it says, uh, yeah, uh, it can be, the sand can be passed through immediately. Those passing through the sands always arrive at L. 
So you give the players a moment as they come in, and they're in between these. There are six blocks, and there's tiny sun in the middle uh, here. And if they don't react immediately by leaving, then they get attacked, and they have they they may learn the very hard way how bad things are. Uh, but they will pretty quickly learn to leave. Then they can. There's a lightning elemental chase in round here, which is as much an, a, a light obstacle as anything, because uh, once you're you know once you're here or here you'll try looking at these doors, the sapphire door and the ruby door. And as soon as you understand there's a pattern, and this is something which is it's not just puzzle dungeons, it's any any patrol-based dungeon. So uh, anything which has patrols you can observe, you learn to stay out of its way. You then have two doors here. You have the ruby gemstone door, um, and uh, yeah, both halls end in unopenable gemstone doors whose lintels are cut with words any magic user will recognise as two doors. Check for monodrones in these halls. So there is a, a classic wandering monster dungeon thing there of like slightly defective monodrones, I think it is. But then, yes, you've got these two. The ruby gemstone has a picture. So does the sapphire gemstone, like a knocker. If you touch knock or touch the ruby door you go to the astral and you have to re-enter via your phylactery so um that is just an exit mechanism of course early on because you're going to have to pop back into this annoying place in the middle with the lightning elemental and you don't know where the lightning elemental is you don't want to do that and you're given a visual clue um and it's not it's not super deadly here because it just kicks you back out you already have survived getting out there once but it means you have to take the risk again and uh, you uh, you fail to see that the clue is there's a road going into the stars. And that's what the knocker tells you. Here you have um, seven um, things that look like eyes but are in fact patterns of sand essentially in the rooms of the hourglass. They, they are the um, top down view. And you've got a thing where knocking once, twice, three, um, so forth, so on and so forth, uh, gets you to different, uh, yeah, so one, one, two, and three take you to different rooms. Offering takes you to VC3 as well. Time God's name takes you to VC4. Um, VC7, you need seven, you, there's a trick, like a bypass, and if you attack stuff, you get sent into a, a like a phylactery, prison um, a bottle city basically a bot you know like a magic bottle to live out your days uh, which is below so you can't get to the whole complex from here you can easily get to the first three you can get to four and uh, you are on two by the way so um, it just takes you back to location a that's an annoying thing and you don't want to do that uh, but you learn that you can get to some via a fairly intuitive one two three knocks uh, but others uh, you need a cheat how are you going to get to the rest of it? Okay, so uh, that's one thing is it doesn't give you access to everything. You're going to have to learn via trying. And then you go to three. Uh, and uh, yeah, this has got monsters in it, etc. And the point is this goes all the way down. Uh, there are different puzzles. This one is is uh, um, slightly, uh, slightly more... Um, it does have a straight combat, which helps. But there's a thing where, yeah, above the rift floats three hourglasses, the central one being much larger. All three are filled with cerulean blue sand. They are not running. And they flip on an axis. Unfortunately, the glass is not connected. There's no obvious way to reach them. And uh, this is a cosmic void, which goes into the astral. So it's not, again, not the worst thing, but you have to go via VC2, which sucks. The different hourglasses, basically, at the... They, they turn, standing within five feet of the rift requires that. Uh, you can um, manipulate the hourglasses using rope and grapnel or jump spell found in VC1, um, or if you have it yourself. So you can jump to them, but they're not attached to anything. So you have to use stuff, including stuff in the dungeon, and a monster appears, and you have to slay the monsters before their hourglass expires. Failure disappears them, the glass has to happen again. Slaying a monster turns it blue, the sand blue, and uh, yeah, the, you can use an item from another room to solve it. So that's something where you are, of course, connecting. The, it's very light, kuntzy in depth. You use the stuff from VC1 or VC4 to solve problems here. Uh, that's not always a puzzle feature, but it is, uh, I think, something of a classic puzzle feature is the idea that, and you see that with um, 
like uh, point and click adventure games the idea that you just get random stuff from elsewhere and then you stick it together in this room to solve the problem when all sand appears the rift appears to drop into a crimson desert and you can jump through to get to vc4 remember otherwise vc4 is not accessible from the entry room except via uh, a time god's name so you can only uh, predictably access it i.e. without having special information that you'd have to then work out that it connected via solving this puzzle and so forth for seven rooms there are different puzzles different problems and they all depend on this same thing um, and you you can combine the two of course but again it's the same loop it's a very different experience to the case of chaos but the same loop uh, we'll talk about um let's talk about uh, wilderness adventures now wilderness adventures are different they don't have and I'll, I'll talk about these three types of adventures separately and uh, in different videos i'll talk about dungeon adventures uh, wilderness adventures and city adventures uh, but they they all contain the core loop and it's not disguised but it operates much like it operates differently between the faction cavern corridor dungeon you know the, oh yes the classic dungeon and the puzzle dungeon it also operates it differently to those again in the um the wilderness adventure i've got here x1 and s4 i've reviewed s4 on the channel um i haven't reviewed b haven't reviewed b2 x1 or joe and 4 i should basically the idea in the wilderness adventure is and a wilderness adventure this is actually one problem with the definition of a city adventure which i'll touch on in a moment but is that an adventure i think ultimately though it is, may well be location based in the grand sense has stuff you can do in the sense it has pointers you could go here and do this rumor tables do provide this i i accept and city adventures particularly d depend on that uh, but i think the idea is that really wilderness ideas wilderness adventures are you have the added danger of the uh wilderness as you you know the different things that are um bad and dangerous in the wilderness but there are oh sorry it's similar to the dungeon but there are layers the new things from the wilderness so there's a new set of resources and new set of risks so you need you need to care about torches in the dungeon torches aren't a big problem in the wilderness campfires maybe uh, but food is much more of a risk overland encounters which are more or less avoidable in different ways than in the dungeon are just different they tend to just be random horrendous things in the wilderness that are not in the dungeon the dungeon because the way it's designed this is i i mean in a meta sense by designers um naturally it there are intent it's intentionally more constrained to the environment and that also has a naturalistic organic way it works in the world you know these monsters live here out in the wilderness you could encounter nothing you can encounter a herd of wild horses catch them sell them or you could encounter manticores um, often the objective of the wilderness adventure when there is a point to it and whether that's rumor generated or or in the module and the module tells you is to get somewhere x1 you start over here basically and you go through the jungle into the mountains to get to this plateau to the ancient abandoned city um, and uh, you get there's a temple and you know there's a particular dungeon and this is this is there's reasonable stuff at the end of x1 there's a decent little thing at the end of x1 uh, but x1 is obviously not really i mean as in there's a multi-level if small dungeon on taboo island particularly but the big thing about this is that aside from the main objective there is this whole wilderness including the, the central plateau as well there's kind of the jungle there's the mountains and the central wilderness there's all these different biomes and environments to cope with to deal with to plan your resources out over and to and also there's additional locations like there's pirates there's blah 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 there's all kinds of different things that are off the beaten track which may help you with the main quest that's not atypical in a um in a uh, wilderness adventure is the uh the wider areas the peripheral areas are potentially aids to what happens in the center and um, it's interesting you b2 has that very light wilderness but it's it's meant to be a basic book and it's also um like it, it's it's not really dealing with that it's trying to give you a, a a big dungeon to help you with dungeon side because it's a basic training book uh, but 
here you kind of kind of look around i'd say also x x1 also has the first mistara map it has the first stuff to do with the known world so it also has that kind of level of things um, but if i just flick my way uh back a lot of the stuff to be fair i would say this is one one uh, slightly harsh thing about isle of dread is lots of the stuff is just the heart is just fighting challenges or running challenges bull sharks sea snakes albeit you can get pearls worth 100 gp so there is treasure xp there um there's an area where there's lots of random encounters there's caves of the rock baboons albeit if you do actually go and clear them out there's 2000 gp of treasure there there's a giant squid uh, there's a pirate camp um and uh, the pirates, it doesn't say they have to be hostile, so you could negotiate if you've learnt those skills by these mid-levels, which you should have. The Rakasta similarly um, could be, uh, our camp cannon should be negotiated with, but it's also, to as, as and especially the Phanatons even more, uh, the Rakasta I guess are quite warlike. But the Rakasta does have um, 10,000 GP weighing 10,000 coins, you know, there are... There are things, there are tribes to interact with, factions to interact with, like in the dungeon, but with the spread out um, resource challenge. And also, I think they have a different feel to the dungeon factions. And some of these things are just, with potential small treasure, they are saps on those resources in a way that is going to um, affect you differently to if you're in the dungeon. In the dungeon, um, the timer is, it's yeah, it's your torches, it's your spells, it's your... Um, uh, etc hit points uh, and when they run out you go to the top and you go home but in the wilderness there's no going home easily you can't be here and say well I guess it's just time to, to leave Gary gives this advice to the uh, to the, the player on wilderness adventures is about finding refuges in the in the player's handbook so there are different skills to pick up but the same thing of working out the situation and resolving it and using the resources uh, I should actually make a note here because I've neglected to Apart from literally resources like lamp, you know, lantern oil and um, a bow for hunting, extra food or something, the other kind of resources are the mechanics in the game. Um, and so, combat is an obvious one. There are combat uh, mechanics available to you and combat resources available to you, which you spend and you learn to spend better based on your experience and I think a classic thing is meeting a monster for the first time where you have to fight it how dangerous is it you don't know so you either over commit or under commit and you learn to commit better next time uh, spells particularly utility spells are another good category players not always getting why utility spells are useful certainly things like create water or purify food or drink as good examples of that in some situations uh, and or goodbury in fact those are resource spells aren't they and uh, jump um, ladder you see that in gel wine full that jump is a spell which has a very specific and you can get a scroll within the within the fall but jump is a very specific example of something which is just really useful there and having that array of spells and knowing when to spend them and knowing if you're a second level character you're a second because it's second to third you're a second level mu so you're going to have two spells or three spells if you're third level and um, you need to kind of work out what the right mix is and i see that you know i've seen that with uh, with many players over time a process of them seeing this is true for spellcasters ah i need a better mix of these things because my party even though i want my cleric to be quite fighty i gotta put some healing in because there's not another cleric i've just got to accept that trade-off so we have some healing on the ground uh wizards it's more pointed because of the limited more limited spells uh that your trade-off between if you have combat spells it's very tempting to be like i have burning hands and magic missile that's what i have but maybe it's going to really be a better shout to have magic missile and comprehend languages or jump you know having utility spells how do you guess what what's going to be in the dungeon well that's again part of the skill it's also part of the party mix um or and it's why you go and buy a scroll you know you dump some of your hard-earned cash on a scroll so you have another option um so yeah i isle of dread uh, here in in BX, to be fair, this is one thing. Um, so there are some wilderness mechanics which 
depend on class and player, but there are fewer. In advanced, which here we have um, S4 Lost Caverns of Sojkanth, another really interesting, uh, very different and, and not quite as pure, but very interesting wilderness adventure that I appreciate is Golden Voyages by Zeb Cook, uh, which has all the flaws of, or not all, many flaws of second edition adventures, and also many strengths of a very good designer. It's a, an al Qadim adventure. Uh, but there, there's a whole thing where the DM picks what the opening mystery is, and then the players sail amongst the island Sinbad Star to find out clues to the mystery. And so there's a resource, it's a resource hunt, it's a kind of gathering of information to resolve a problem, which is not, as I say, not an atypical wilderness thing. You have to find something. In X1, you know it's somewhere in the middle of the island. In that sense, maybe that is a bit easier. Um, you know, the players know they go from here, they're going somewhere around here. Uh, on the other hand, Lost Caverns, a thing is, the players don't know where they're going. They know some locations, they know some potential locations to go and search for things. Uh, that's back to Bissell. But they do not know where the Lost Caverns are. They have to find them. I've reviewed Lost Caverns if you want to hear a bit more about that. But there's, there's, and this is the, this is Gary showing, putting his money where his mouth is. You can go and meet an ally with gnomes, particularly if you help them. And you can stay with them as the equivalent of having a village nearby. Uh, they also are relevant in the, in the official sequel, uh, WG4, um, Lost Temple of Tharazdan. You know, that uh, they are, uh, they are people who can you can be friends with and you can work with in this area and so here um, and yeah the the idea of the scavenger hunt is not an atypical um, uh, atypical wilderness thing and it's something you get a bit of either the scavenger hunt or the hunt for one location also come up in the mini um, mini wilderness adventures that I've talked about before I won Dwellers of the Forbidden City UK one beyond the crystal cave which are both very small scale but still wilderness adventures because of the way the environment works uh, literally the fact they're both outdoors over a over a mile or two or something um, of of ground that you know width wise but the point being uh, in fact I think theoretically less than that uh, but the idea being that you've got to go between locales and um, and gather information dungeons even puzzle dungeons don't really have that same thing going on. It's very rare. I think it's something that naturally fits the more open 3D environments outdoors, and particularly, as with Sojkanth, the more spread out it is. So this loop of spending resources to get through the mountains, uh, going and getting information and then returning to your base, if we're either a temporary one or if you're friends with the gnomes, go to the gnomes. In advanced, this is one thing that characters have skills, and we talked about magic as an example but both in the dungeon and out of the dungeon other skills are relevant and uh, both in first and second the obvious example for Sojkanth is rangers to do with tracking um, whether as an NWP or as a special class unique skill I think that's an obvious one uh, similarly in the dungeon the dwarf or elf um, and their their specific dungeon specific um, skills uh, but I think that idea that the ranger has skills that are relevant to overland stuff a bit like uh, some elves as well actually to do with uh, elves and halflings being able to go ahead of the party are relevant in the wilderness to do with stealth or to do with tracking and second edition amps that up with both sub uh, or uh, unearthed arcana as well technically with sub races which may may have different abilities and you're trying to get the right mix for that environment the wilderness challenges different skills um partly and you see this in my dark sun game the kind of logistics involved in a serious wilderness game are a lot more um, in-depth and complex than dungeon logistics. Dungeon logistics are real, uh, but I th they don't require uh, actual accounting. And I don't think that's a problem, I'm just saying it is part of that, that loop. Finally, the city adventure. The city adventure, by the way, I'll talk about this in the, what, the actual video I do on it, but the city adventure is, I think, a rare beast, the real city adventure, because mostly um, the best city supplements are generally speaking, uh, well, they're supplements rather than adventures, even if they're called adventures. City State of the Invincible Overlord, say, or um, SJR5 Rocker Bra, which I think, though flawed, is, is very good. Um, city of Skulls from Greyhawk is actually a city adventure, uh, which is an adventure. 
Um, but say another, and this is one I'm going to briefly look at, and I'll look at one of my own adventures as well. Here, uh, Backlin EMDT65 Backlin Jewel and Seas, which is the one of the capstones to Gabor Lux's Aurelion setting, has uh, yeah is is a city supplement that just gives you lots of info on a place, and it has um, rumors, and rumors are obviously the classic. Uh, way in in this situation where you go and pursue stuff on your own and one reason that i think gab just to, to speculate on gabor's um idea there is one it needs to be an environment you can just plug and play not there's one adventure it's a whole city but also there's a much more it hits that fritz uh, it hits that fritz lieber fafford and uh, the gray mauser feel more if there's all these weird bits and pieces you can investigate and they also they all stick together um i'm just going to find there is one location which i think gives an insight into uh, the kind of thing we're looking at though uh, which is pretty typical in the uh, city adventure that characterizes the the skill loop and the skills you're developing so uh, tower of girls there was an evil w wizard who is here it's locked up tight the upper floors are not described here but the inner courtyard goes down uh, this entrance is used by the goblin city um, who trade with the topsiders and catch the occasional urchin Everyone around the place has heard of Pizza the Fine, Halfling Adventurer. So what's interesting here is that if you were to say, let's pretend this were a fully written up adventure, not a not a kind of capsule, but this was actually the thing we didn't have to put any effort into running, uh, developing, because it was already written up. Um, I'm not complaining, I'm just saying, let's pretend this was the adventure, or we have gone ahead and developed it ourselves. Well, what kinds of things are going to match about it? Well, the players... Um, may have heard they there is a rumor a central rumor and they're gonna have to go and find that out from going and talking to people and they're gonna come here and assuming the top floor is not where they immediately go the upper floors they instead go down well there's a descent and then it goes down into the goblin cellar and uh, Muglub the goblin lord uh, doesn't know what to do with so many goblins and will gladly rent them out uh, and uh, just about evil men coming and taking uh, their treasure uh, which uh, goes uh, to f further rooms in more complex areas it uh, goes down a level in fact in the undercity so you could go and talk to Muglub of the and the goblin lord and his band uh, and they trade with uh, upsiders too uh, and there's also specific treasure in the uh, highest window so there's a few things that you're going to do you could be breaking into the tower you could be going down and killing goblins because they're stealing urchins they're catching urchins um you could be trading with them on behalf of barnacle bill's gang uh you could be just actually going down there and you either have to negotiate or not and that's like a dungeon and the undercity of backton is dungeon like but the way in which you transition from the not pure danger all the time top side to the liminal state downstairs uh, down in the undercity or the kind of micro dungeon small dungeon in the tower um is one of the features of the city uh, adventure and uh, gary does characterize this as a non-stop thing but also the sociality and the need to gain different bits of information um is in one way it's similar to the wilderness adventure except you're not trying to go and explore places and find stuff it tends to be that you're going from one place to the next and so there's a high need for social skills this is something which is very often coming off the character sheet and purely amongst the players the skill that it is explored here very often um, apart from the classic risk rewards of do we push further into the undercity um, we've heard of pits are going missing is that a good warning for us not to follow or should we risk ourselves and go up we're better than pits of the uh, pits of the fine uh, but apart from that it's also that you're gonna have to glue the different bits together socially and there are some dungeons that push that for, uh, and virtually all big dun good dungeon adventures or big dungeon adventures have some of this going on uh, but I think the city adventure is characterized by investigation and negotiation um, and the liminal state between the peaceful peaceful city and the violent um, other world uh, that's not the case in the dungeon or the wilderness in very specific and forced circumstances those are places where you've crossed the threshold into the other world and things are dangerous 
Uh, the city is a place where there is danger more at some times than others. And look at uh, Waterdeep City System or um, Gabor's... Uh, is it... What's it called? Uh, Night Tables? Whatever. Uh, the book that kind of goes with this, uh, Encounter Tables. Um, those ones, they, 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 there's danger and it's always a bit seedy because these are Lankmarish places. Uh, but that's the liminality. And you've got to stay on the bubble because if you... There are actually much more organized forces who will screw you over if you break that because you're not just talking about different factions of monsters we're talking about the power of the city so yeah there's a different environment which requires an adaptation and players who don't adapt like that will go to prison if nothing else you you've done it in uh, in oblivion and skyrim it's the same thing here and i think an example of a more focused example at least of this um investigation thing and this dynamic of of uh, investigating and negotiating, but the, then it exploding into D and D, like often more at its most spaghetti western like violence is uh, for good or for bad. Uh, my, the adventure I ran for the um, the first arc or whatever of our, our Spelljammer stream, slavery and plagues, where uh, there I did there's some basic stuff. There's a delivery job that could lead to combat. Uh, there's a, this is not fully written up, so you can see most of my ideas here, some minor jobs. You're asked to retrieve missing kids. Uh, there is an 8th level thief who is helping your employers uh, one way or another. Um, include may get you out of a mess. I, that was the thing I more or less ran as a one and done thing, that if you kept making trouble that needed you getting out of messes, then he would not help you again. Uh, but basically you're being hired because there's a plague so there's not as many high level adventures but also your mooks keeping it on the down low and possibly with Chorus Ormond following up and actually finishing the job if you fail and die who cares if you fail and die uh, yeah so there's a city thing with intrigue you've already got a thing where there's a thematic thing that's not about the play loop by the way that's just thematic to do with the style of adventure but then because you're looking for missing kids and you're given a few a few uh, leads um, you know, went missing near the docks. Um, there, oh, sorry, went missing in the noble estates. Uh, but um, might it, there, some some potential site of a blonde child seen near uh, down near the docks or something. So you go and explore. Uh, you find out more kids have been going missing. But you can also instead of going there, you could go to well, I, I did daytime, nighttime noble estates. Things that might be relevant. Uh, Lord Hastain and um, House Eladon's uh, gardener, dwarf gardener, Dorfin, who saw some of this. These are social things, aren't they? You're going to have to go and talk to Dorfin. You're going to, going to have to go to a party. You'll get involved in factional stuff there. Hastain is a member of the Council of Lords. Marish Kartan is the daughter of the Seneschal. The Low Market, if you go there, particularly if you've picked up another missing kids, including Jackson, you're going to talk to Old Man Star, and he... Uh, may even come and help. I mean, he's uh, yeah. Uh, he, he did not get very involved. He's got one leg, but um, he uh, is aged, but can still fire a crossbow. So he helped the party. This might lead you to. Uh, I think I did. They also did I not mention it here? Oh yeah. Um, he suggests going and talking at the Yakuza. Well, he's searching for Jackson. He wants uh, the Yakuza to help him. So that also draws in another faction. So you have these the different spinning plates, and it's at this point outside of up to this point outside of uh, a, a pre-planned attack on a on a caravan you end up being escorting um, across town which gives you your players a chance for action the assumption is this is largely non-violent and the encounters they had and the encounters my players actually had were like pickpockets a rake demanding a duel not actually like a full-on fight or anything and uh, yeah things could have gone wrong with the Yakuza uh, here uh, but they didn't uh, in in the game uh, but yes, the, it's high negotiation, but always on the bubble. Then, as you track down to where slaves have been held, but that aren't currently being held generally, uh, there's no one there uh, at the point the adventure starts, the house, Ironfest Warehouse. You, uh, I, this, uh, there's a map associated with this. This probably needs a slightly better write-up. But the idea that you've got a... Um, order of battle, rough order of battle. So this is just a micro dungeon. There's stuff you can find in places, and uh, yeah, that that was a there's a puzzle involved, a symbolic substitution that was fairly easy. Um, there's some treasure, and there is a 
investigation it's it's actually a patrol based it's essentially following a patrol same skill as in the dungeon um, based following a guy to the hideout in the hideout there's again order of battle and there are prisoners you can rescue um, this was a very dicey fight um, yes uh, and there's uh, a paid off watchman on patrol who might uh, send you off in another direction so uh, and, and indeed chance of grave robbers so there's a few opportunities for things to go um, spaghetti western uh, there's the warehouse you might raid to find out and you could sneak in that was an option um, but you might sneak into or or you might just bust up um, my players went for the bust up and the same with the the uh, the hideout where the kids are being taken because they're going to under under brawl um, is what well one option for where they're going and so uh, there's this dynamic where you can have that but a lot of it uh, consists of the social skills and the clue solving skills which do you relate to other stuff players have, have have done in the examples we've looked at puzzle dungeons and negotiating with factions but the emphasis is different and the skills have to improve accordingly because if you try to do the same thing you've done elsewhere you will fail um, anyway that is some examples I've got uh, and I, I don't know if that's a uh, I think that's a, a hopefully a fruitful way to look at it is to just try to look at examples of how this play loop works out across different adventures um, because it is the universal play loop of early D&D and what the game mechanically expects and rewards. Uh, of course, even in the city adventure, if you're playing second edition AD&D, NWPs are going to matter in some circumstances. There are different resources, uh, but it's notable the way the resources shift, uh, the way the skills need to shift. Um, and, and obviously, the more you are negotiating and gathering information, usually, not in all circumstances, fast talking and information gathering are NWPs that can help uh, but the more it comes off the character sheet and into the player's judgment is one reason why some OSR players uh, like very rules light or rules, rules neutral almost games which are very highly discursive and creative uh, but d and um, the play loop being defined ultimately by the hard consequences of not getting XP and of dying um, is something which which bounds that play loop and I think um, so seeing these things as a continuity where even though um, they sometimes look different they all use that same play loop and they all lead to the same results of XP survival improvement um, is I think a helpful way of understanding what's going on in D&D &D and, and, and maybe how it's best designed and played therefore anyway those are my thoughts share yours in the comments how do you play D&D? Till next time.